guys, I'm a little bit sleepy, but we're gonna watch a murder show. Uh, this one might be like a, uh, did the police make sh con coerce confessions out of people type thing. This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we discussed the Reykjavik Confessions, an Icelandic case in which six people confessed to murders that police have no physical evidence ever occurred. This is a treat oh. for me because, as you know, yeah. uh, I went on a trip to Iceland last year. Yeah, I've heard Love about it. it. It certainly it is one of the many arrows in your anecdote quiver. A big one. Well, I'm excited to tell you that perhaps the place that you deemed heaven maybe isn't so heavenly. Ooh. Stunning. Vistas. Yeah, hot springs, great stuff. Let's get into it. On January 26th, 1974, Guthmundur Einarsson, a quiet 18-year-old laborer, went out drinking with some friends. Oh, they ended messy. up in a dance hall in Haben Arfjörður, a town just south of Reykjavik. Guthmundur left the party in the early hours of the day and decided to walk home. Around 2 a.m., two of his friends saw Guthmundur on the road, trying to hitch a ride with another man they did not oh. recognize. Both men were clearly drunk, yeah, and Guthmundr drunk as fuck. swayed as he stumbled his way through the snow. Guthmundr never made it home. Uh -oh. At the time, the entire country of Iceland's Yikes. population was about 220,000 people. For yeah, context, people. that's 5,000 fewer people than lived in Reno, Nevada in 2010. Major Probably crimes were people. very, very uncommon. They didn't even have government bodies tasked with finding missing people. That's After a few that should be a priority for every civilization. Weeks of searching and coming up empty, the volunteer search parties ended their hunt. Yeah, yeah. not a lot of crime. They're not used to it. Still, I mean, you should have some systems in place. Let me tell you something about Iceland. Go One for morning, it. we woke up to go on a beautiful kayak trip. The woman who drove us to the kayak thing, we were talking about just the way things go there. And she said, you know, we don't have a lot of crime here. About once a year, we will do a murder. And she made <laughs> And I was like, okay, I know you don't, you're not implying that the whole country gets together and picks one person yeah, like the yeah. lottery and decides to sacrifice them. The, like sort was of that a the verbiage she used? she used? She said, we will do a murder. Do a murder. Yeah. <laughs> Around 10 months after Guthmundur Einarsson disappeared on November 19, 1974, a quiet construction worker, Gerfinner Einarsson, with no relation to Guthmundur, yeah, was watching TV with mornings. a friend at his home in Keplavik. The pair briefly left to go to the Harbor Cafe, but Gerfinner shortly returned. Back at home, he received a phone call. His wife, Gufni, said Gerfinner told the man on the other end of the call, quote, I've already come, end quote, followed by, quote, I'll come, end quote. Gerfinner then drove his car into town, parked close to a cafe, left his keys in the ignition, exited his vehicle, and was never uh -oh. seen again. Two guys disappear within the span of 10 months. They have the same last name, no relation. In a place where this is not common. Yes. So we may have a bit of a crook on our hands. Yeah, maybe yeah. time to round up. Wait, are there polar bears in Iceland? What if at least one of them got eaten by a polar bear? Like the drunk guy probably could have gotten eaten by, gotten eaten by something. The a task usual. force. To find the missing people. Another missing person meant another search party of volunteers who found no trace they of their finger. This being the second shit. disappearance within the year, detectives decided it might be time to do a bit more sleuthing. You the think? first step for police was to find out who called Gerfinner. Two teenagers and a cafe employee described a man they had seen place a call from a phone booth outside the cafe. From these descriptions, the police made a clay recreation of a man's face and began showing it around. Keplavik is a small town, so when no one could identify the man depicted in the police's model, no they assumed to, like, the man was from out of good. town. The manager of a nightclub in nearby Reykjavik was questioned, but released. By the following summer, detectives had no witnesses and, crucially, no bodies. What they did have were rumors swirling around one Sivar Siselski. So this is a, the the possible suspect. This is the possible suspect based yeah. off description. So instead of doing like a, a police sketch, they did a yeah. arts and crafts. They got a little Mr. Potato Head there. They got a little Mr. Potato Head, yeah, exactly. Sivar <laughs> Siselski was a local petty criminal with a penchant for stealing things like alcohol, candles, and checkbooks. He sold drugs and would tell his girlfriend, oh. Erla Botladot. Why would he steal candles? Is he like reselling the candles at a higher price? About his desire to commit the quote, perfect crime. 
end quote. Together, the two would forge checks, using Ertla's job as a telex operator for Iceland's post and telecommunication company. Shortly after Gerfinner went missing, Ertla and Saivar bought one-way tickets to Copenhagen with money they'd embezzled from Ertla's job. So these are, these are, these is like a Bonnie and Clyde situation. Yeah. You know what, actually, now that you bring this up, I did go to Copenhagen right after Iceland, and it is a... Stop sub- talking about your vacation! Wouldn't mind escaping there. In Denmark, Ertla soon became pregnant, and the couple Oopsie. moved back to Reykjavik to have their baby in September 1975. In order to support his new family, Saivar's plan was to smuggle cannabis How into about Iceland. A job? Perhaps consequently, Ertla decided the two should live apart. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna provide for this family with some of that sticky, sticky green stuff. With some of that good, good. Gonna turn <laughs> Iceland into Greenland, baby. <laughs> While police were still stymied by the previous year's two disappearances, they had been making progress on a case of some stolen money at the Post and Telecommunication Company. On December 12, 1975, Saivar was arrested on suspicion of embezzlement. Two days later, Ertla was also oh, taken man. into custody. Ertla initially denied everything. Authorities questioned her and detained her in solitary confinement. After seven days of grueling questioning, she confessed uh, to the post of telecommunication you, fraud. Okay, confession getting from people is complicated and people fuck up a As lot. she was preparing to be released, investigators showed Ertla a photo of Gudmundur Einarsson, the first man to go missing, who she recognized from Reykjavik. Of course she's gonna recognize him. Well, and it's like a small, small, uh, con- small population of country. And two, you were breaking your brain for seven days. They had once shared a card together and had on another occasion run into one another at a party. Ertla told investigators that she vaguely remembered the night Gudmund there disappeared. She had been at a nightclub without Saivar, who she thought was in Denmark at the time. When she got home, she immediately fell asleep though she recalled a nightmare in which she could hear Saivar's voice whispering outside her window. Sensing the faintest hint of a lead, police asked her if it was possible she hadn't been dreaming. So, instead of releasing her, they then threw Ertla back in solitary confinement. Good lord. She admits to the embezzlement, yeah. and then they throw a Hail Mary. They say, here's a picture of Gumun there. Yeah. Hey, you do crimes. Do you know that- Stupid <laughs> cops! She has a nightmare uh, that Saivar who is unaccounted for, is whispering outside of her window. The police then say, maybe it wasn't a nightmare. Yeah. They then throw her back into solitary confinement. Jesus Two birds, fucking Christ. One stone, as they say. That is what they say. It's a little something I heard in Iceland. Alone, Ertla began to doubt her memories. She thought, quote, is it possible they killed someone in the apartment and I saw the whole thing and I can't remember, end quote. Ertla was questioned for six hours on December 20th naming Saivar and their friend Christian Witter as possible suspects in Gudmundur's disappearance. She also mentioned being perplexed to come home on January 27, 1974, the day after Gudmundur disappeared, to find her bedsheet missing. Investigators drew up a confession that said she saw Saivar and three others carry the body of Gudmundur while wrapped in the missing bedsheet. Ertla signed it after being kept in solitary confinement for days and being threatened to be kept there indefinitely, all while she had an 11-week-old baby. Oh my gosh, she had the baby! Ertla herself was only 20 years old. Like, you put me in a room for three straight days. I'm starting to already question my sense of reality. I did not even take the quarantine well. I wouldn't, I would probably eat a police officer. Yeah, I'm, I need to, to talk to people. The next day, Saivar, who had been in solitary confinement this whole time, oh was my God. for 10 hours, then six hours the day after. Once what investigators finally cops? showed him Ertla's confession, Saivar told investigators he was involved, along with three friends, Christian, who Saivar had seen that Ertla had already named, Trigvi Runar and Albert Klan. So he's in solitary, he's wondering what the hell is going on. They're grilling him for 16 hours, and then they show that his, you know, I guess former significant other has mm-hmm. a signed confession saying this is what he did. I think that's the last straw, right, that breaks the camel's back. And you may suspect if he's thinking, well, if I confess to this, maybe they'll just get me out of solitary. But if I implicate some other people, maybe, maybe that'll spread it out a bit. Exactly. 
the police had developed an unfortunate habit of throwing their suspects in solitary confinement any time they needed to solicit a confession in this criminal case. They arrested <gasps> the three men and threw them into solitary. Eventually, the men all confessed to playing roles in Guthmunder's murder. Now that they had extracted confessions for one disappearance, the investigators wondered, was it possible that they could solve the second one too? No. Pretty much everyone I met in Iceland was so kind and so polite. I just imagine the most polite people in the world doing this and being like, well, we figured out that if you put them in that room, <laughs> you know, they tell you the truth <laughs> oh after God. like a month or two. So I guess maybe we'll just keep doing that. I would like to not think that's the case. I would like to think that maybe the community is pressuring like, this guy's running rampant. They're killing, they killed two people. That's yeah. twice the output of the last 20 years. We gotta do something. And this is the answer. They're, they're doing result-based investigative techniques. Of course. Yeah. They're getting the signature. They did their job in their head. Yeah. That's how they're legitimizing it. Which, like I said, some people, you could, you could understand that. Police went back to Ertla and asked if it was possible the men they'd gotten confessions out of for Gudmundir's disappearance could have also been involved in Gerfiner's as well. Ertla replied, quote, maybe, end quote. The police told her, quote, we have a reason to believe that you have experienced something traumatic concerning Gerfinner's disappearance, and we are going oh, to- Oh, no! End quote. They were like, do you think this could maybe be connected to this other disappearance? And she said, maybe. And yeah. they were like, oh yeah, that's the green light, baby. Fire up that room again. <laughs> Fire up that room? <laughs> this is ridiculous. Not uh, great, not great. This is the second time they have taken her out she assigned something and thought, I'm free. Good to go. And then they said, uh-uh-uh, in you go. So you just gotta think about what that would do to your brain. Her brain is Play-Doh right now. Yeah. The police began to question Erla, Saivar, and Christian about Gerfinner's disappearance, and sure enough, received confessions from all of them. Their stories, however, kept changing. At one point, the murder happened on a boat, but the final confession presented in court said the men had killed him on land. Eventually, Christian mentioned a foreign-looking man who helped them murder Gerfiner. That foreign-looking man was eventually identified as Gutjon Skarpjetensen, a former teacher of Saivar's. If you had a good teacher, they say like, write a note to him, let him know how much you appreciate it. Give him an apple or something. Yeah, it'd be weird to be like, hey, you did a great, you, I really liked the multiplication tables we did. You want to kill a guy? <laughs> you did a really good job molding my mind. You did a, such a good job, I'd like you to come in with me on this big score. <laughs> like, uh, How'd you like to make a man disappear? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you look the Joker. Guthjon was arrested on November 12, 1976, though he initially claimed he could not remember the night in question, which at this point was yeah. almost two years ago. 17 days after commemoration, commemoration from last week. Or even yesterday. He's of solitary confinement managed to jog his memory, and he confessed. By December 1976, Ertla, Saivar, Christian, Guthjon, Trigvi, and Albert had confessed to involvement in the murders. Despite the fact that all suspects demonstrated foggy memory of the events, the fact that Ertla, Saivar, and Christian all tried to retract their confessions, which the court rejected, and the fact that no murdered bodies had been discovered. In December 1977, they were all found guilty by the court and given various sentences relating to their involvement. Oh boy. <laughs> It's getting a little. Uh... Yeah, it's it. This is this is now getting kind of comical at this point. Yeah, they're just roping them in. It's worth pausing to go over what life was like for the six while they were detained by the police. Albert spent a total of uh. 88 days in solitary confinement. Ertla spent 240 Jesus. days. Gutjon spent 412 days. Trigvi spent 627. Christ. Christian spent 682. And Saivar spent a whopping Why are the cops such days, pieces more than of shit. Full years in solitary confinement. They were periodically prohibited from sleeping and interrogated Why? hundreds of times. According That's to prison guard Winner Thor Magnusson, Saivar's head would be dunked in buckets that is of water torture. as he was told he'd drown if he did not confess. Fucking that hell. is ridiculous. Literal it seems like war crimes. Force a confession like this, it's like they maybe may not reveal they've got someone locked up dunking their head in a bucket. <laughs> yeah, they seem pretty proud of themselves. You know, I imagine, yeah, they, they were pleased with the results. While in detention, Christian twice yeah. attempted suicide. Yeah, he was made to pose in recreated crime scene photos. 
In one, Christian strangles a police officer who is standing in for Gierfener. False memory experts say that the acting out of supposed crimes can make those crimes more concrete and realistic in the suspect's mind. I wonder if that guy really did strangle the cop because that cop probably deserved it. On May 3rd, 1976, Ertla, who was not being detained at the time, was brought in for questioning as a witness. She was kept in custody over oh, come on! and the following day, seemingly out of nowhere, gave a statement that she had shot Gerfinner. Fuck. She was then detained in solitary until December 22nd. Their cruelty seems to know no end. If you're already doubting yourself and thinking like, man, maybe, maybe my brain is just blocking off that part of my memory. Suddenly, now, you've got sensations to tie to all the things that you may or may have not done. The psychology of it is like, maybe if I give them this or that, they'll let me go. Yeah. And that's all it becomes. On New Year's Eve, 1976, Gisli Gutjonsson, a young detective at the time of the disappearances who has since become one of the world's foremost false memory syndrome experts, gave Gutjon a lie detector test. That test sparked something in Gutjon, causing him to suddenly question whether he had been involved at all. He couldn't remember any of it happening. Gisli, author of the book, The Psychology of False Confessions, 40 Years of Science and Practice, says false memory syndrome, which can be triggered by interrogations with false evidence, isolation, and tense emotional situations, can lead to false confessions. Gisli says that a diary kept by Gutjon while he was detained in solitary for 14 months was the best example of false memory syndrome he's ever seen. Of the whole case, Gisli says that, quote, these individuals had absolutely no knowledge of what happened. They were just trying to appease the police. They were trying to be cooperative because they knew if they were not cooperative, they would be given more oh, solitary man. confinement, end quote. Well, now, who's this young go-getter showing up on the scene? Because I like the cut of his jib. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's kind of riding in like the white knight. I like yeah. that you got this young detective sitting there. He's probably like, hey, you know, uh, that guy's been in that room for 700 days. Maybe that's not the best practice that we should be engaging in. Yeah, yeah we want to maybe think about what we're doing here, folks. Oh, no, no, okay. Well, I'm going to write a book about this. You know, it <laughs> comes a changing of the guard, so to speak. Yeah. And it yeah. was necessary here. Yeah. In September yeah. 2018, everyone was acquitted, but Erdogan oh, come on, was still earning a conviction of perjury. By then, everyone had already finished serving their sentences, and Saivar and Christian had already died, both in Fucking their 50s. Hell. While much of that was about how horrible you wasted your resources. Well, the justice system in Iceland was in the 1970s, there's still a mystery to get to the bottom of. So with that, here are some theories about what happened to Gudmundur Einarsson and Gethmerner Einarsson. The first theory is that the police got this one right. Gudmundur was murdered by Ertla, Saivar, Christian, Albert, and Trygvi. I'm pressing next to was now. by Ertla, Saivar, Christian, and Gudjon. What evidence is there of this? No bodies were ever found, though there was Ertla's missing bedsheet. Missing bedsheet doesn't always equal murder. You know, my freshman year of college... Maybe someone had diarrhea on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we went to Bed Bath & Beyond to get some, some stuff. And my mom was like, hey, you should get these rubber sheets. <laughs> and I said, why, on, why in the hell would I buy rubber sheets? And she was like, you know, in case you spill, like, a pop on your bed or oh, something. Oh, I thought she was going to say because you're, like, sleeping in a pool of your own vomit. No, no, no. I was like, are you nuts? <laughs> Anyway, back to the murder. <laughs> Did you buy the rubber sheets? I'm actually... No, I didn't buy the rubber sheets. Okay. I think you're who, getting... Who would do that? Apparently you, because you're getting pretty touchy about it, which makes me feel <laughs> I just, like... I just you know think what? it's Why hilarious. Why don't you go stand in there? Wait, would it be like... Would it be like... This sheet right here? Or the sheet that would go under this one that people normally have, but I don't because that's like a lot of work. It's like enough of a pain as to put on one of these stupid little bed sheets. That room for 10 days, and then I'll ask you about the rubber okay, sheets. Okay, yeah. How yeah. about that? I like it. It's yeah. good. You're bringing it back around. The second theory is that neither man was murdered, while crime was very uncommon in Iceland. I think like a polar bear attack doesn't count as murder. Iceland. Disappearances were not. In fact, Disappearances happen so often in Iceland that they feature prominently in the country's folklore. 
In the 50 years prior to these cases, dozens of people had gone missing in Iceland, most of them their cases unsolved. In the more than 40 years since the disappearances of Gudmundur Einarsson and Gerfner Einarsson, they too have also taken on a nearly mythical quality within Icelandic culture. Oh, I'm the act as the police incompetence is legendary. I'm buying that because in Iceland, big open fields where I don't think people are walking on the, on the reg. So you, you get a body out there, decomposes, nobody knows. Yeah. I'm booking, 50 my, years I'm, later. I'm booking my ticket to Iceland right now. You've sold me. You, you gotta check it out. I wasn't on board until you got to the decomposing body in an open field, but after that... It's a lot of land. <laughs> a lot of okay. land. A lot of bodies out there, man. Yeah. A third theory is that the men were murdered, but by someone else. New evidence in the case has... Yeah, I think maybe the second guy might have been murdered. ...compelled investigators to reopen it. A Some new shit. witness says they saw two men carry a third, weakened man onto a boat the day Gerfner went missing. That man allegedly told the eyewitness, quote, remember me, end quote. When the boat that was carrying two men and the one weakened man returned to shore, there were only the two men on board. Sus. Recently, this witness claims to have seen one of the men in East Iceland, decades later, working on electricity lines. Weird that you wouldn't just, if you saw someone carrying a weakened man who looked at you and said, remember me, you wouldn't uh, maybe call report the local that, report authorities. That. Yeah. Get the police on the horn, maybe do a little, hey, I saw a guy get carried off. He yeah. looked like he couldn't walk. He said, remember me. May want to look into it, and they'd be like, well, we don't have a missing task force, so. See you later. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> Hang it up. And that's that. Yeah. While these mysterious disappearances took place over four... Okay, the first guy, he could have been, like, killed in a hit and run. Or the guy that hit him, like, threw a body in a truck and then threw... Then to, got to, like, the ocean, threw the body in the water and got eaten by sea life. 40 years ago, we can draw important lessons for today in the way the cases were handled. While it might be tempting to try and cram facts to fit a convenient theory, truth works the other way around. Had authorities been better equipped to discover the facts of the case, perhaps we'd know what happened to Gudmundur and Gerfinner. But because of a rush to find a convenient solution, these Icelandic disappearances remain unsolved. Stupid shitty cops. I hope the, I hope the people got a nice big lawsuit money. See y'all next one. I am a bit sleepy.